distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to you all. When I came here, I was told to break all protocol. So, <laughs> uh, I think there's been a lot of silence in this room. Uh, if you can just say you're with me. Thank you. <laughs> it is indeed a distinct honor for me to address you today on behalf of the people of the Maldives here in this historical city of Malacca in this important conference on youth, ocean and SDG 14. I thank Honorable Tantri Dr. Muhammad Ali Rustam, Chairman of the World Youth Foundation and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here today. I am particularly pleased that this conference is held here in this bustling city which once was the center of trade, in, trade and commerce in East Asia. Indeed, the historical importance of the city of Malacca to the oceans can never be overstated. Just less than a few kilometers to our west, it is home to the famous Malacca Strait that attracted hundreds of ships from all corners of the world each year. These ships sailed the world oceans, the Atlantic, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Andaman Sea, and arrived to this bustling metropolis to trade silk and porcelain from China, textiles from Gujarat, nutmeg, maize, cloves and molluscs, and gold and pepper from Sumatra. The vibrant neighborhoods and the rich culture of this beautiful city is testament to the historical role of the oceans in moving people, goods, and connecting cultures. I'm particularly inspired by the presence of so many young people here today. For it is your courage and commitment that matter most in our collective effort to bring about a healthy ocean for the generations to come. You're the torchbearers of today's actions against climate and ocean change. Ladies and gentlemen, the unique challenges faced by small island developing states or cities like the Maldives in ensuring a sustainable development for our countries are sometimes too great, uh, the challenges are too great for us to fathom. Our remoteness, the smallness of our land mass, the inability to achieve economies of scale, and our limited financial capacity, just to list a few. The oceans are of special importance to each of the cities, for our livelihoods are almost entirely dependent on ocean-related industries. Oceans are the source of our sustenance, wealth, and recreation. Over 50% of the Maldives' GDP are dependent on fisheries and coastal tourism. Fisheries accounts for 11% of employment and 98% of country's physical export commodities. Thanks to our pristine lagoons, colorful coral reefs, and spectacular marine life, today the tourism sector accounts for the biggest portion of the Maldives' economy. 70% of all foreign currency earnings are generated from the tourism sector. In 2018 alone, it contributed to over 32% of the government revenue. Being the single largest employer in the country, tourism sector accounts for, uh, for four out of every 10 jobs in the country. And I know that our fellow small developing states, like the Fiji, like Madam Romina mentioned, have, the have a similar economic outlook. Most, if not all of them, depend entirely on ocean-related industries for their livelihoods. Whether it's pearl farming in Cook Islands, sports fishing in Palau, or deep sea fishing in seashells. Ladies and gentlemen, for far too long, far too many have neglected that our very own existence on this planet depends on the blue heart of it, the oceans. Yet, until recently, the focus of climate change concerned about our fate on the land, despite it covering a very small percentage of the Earth's surface. The adverse effects of this man-made phenomenon of climate change are many. It cripples our food supplies, shapes the weather patterns, it destructs marine habitats, and it simply kills the sea life underwater. I would like to ask how short-sighted can mankind be for science has increasingly been revealing that the ocean buffers the earth against this baleful occurring. Thanks to science today, it is known that the increasing levels of carbon in the atmosphere increases the acidity of the oceans. It is proven that this relentless rise threatens the existence of marine life. In 2013, the level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere surpassed 400 parts per million for the first time in recorded history. 
the oceans absorb more than 90% of the total carbon dioxide to purify the air we breathe. It's not a free pass though. It comes at the expense of the millions of lives beneath it. Thus it is naive to think that the oceans would provide humankind with sustenance forever if we neglect them today. No nation, however, big or small, is immune to climate change and ocean change. However, the level of impact greatly varies from one country to another. Our marine ecosystem is head to, headed towards irreparable damage. The impact of it is, no, no doubt, far too great. Today, hundreds of thousands of shipping vessels and oil tankers dump plastics and microplastics into the ocean. An equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic is dumped into the oceans every single minute. And like Madam Varsha mentioned, if we continue to do this, if we go down this path, by 2050 there will be more plastics in the sea than there are fish, if you consider the weight. In some parts of the world, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing and all sorts of marine pollution, such as sewage disposals and industrial waste dumping, dumping are believed to be an inevitable effect of economic growth. This has become a norm. Ladies and gentlemen, as a small island nation, the Maldives understands that any corrective measures taken by a country of our size would only have very little significance to re reverse the impact of climate change. But because the threat is too great, we cannot and we will not sit by and hope that the big countries would come to our rescue. But we do know that we cannot do this alone. We realize that any effort to combat climate and ocean change must be a collective effort. We must forge global partnerships at all levels, multilateral and bilateral, with every nation, regardless of its size or the level of its economic prosperity. I urge the youth participants here today to reflect on the initiatives you are taking in your communities to protect, the, protect and conserve the oceans. I'm thankful that the World Youth Foundation seeks to create opportunities for the youth to get involved in these activities. For their commitment is very important. I am proud to say that the Maldives has been actively engaged as a staunch advocate of the action on climate and ocean change mitigation for the past three decades. At bilateral and multilateral levels, we have come a long way. Since the inception of Montreal Protocol in 1989, the first universally ratified international treaty designed to protect the ozone layer, through Copenhagen in 2009 to the recent COP21 summit in Paris in 2015, our leaders have brought to the attention of the world leaders the imminent danger of global warming and sea level rise. Many of you, I'm of course referring to the youth in this room, were not, were not born when the Maldives first convened ministers and representatives from 14 island nations from the Pacific, Europe, the Caribbean, Africa, uh, to our conference on sea level rise in the Maldives in Mali in November 1989. It was still the early days of climate change politics. Terms such as global warming and sea level rise would not be synonymous with climate change until the turn of the 21st century. The citizens of low-lying countries like the Maldives, the Fiji, and the Pacific Islanders who had already been enduring the worst understood the predicament at this very early stage. 2015 was a historical year in many ways for the action on global climate and ocean change. As surprising as it may sound, the impact of humankind's action on the ocean's well-being was not fully recognized in climate policy circles until the beginning of the current decade. The UN system and its member countries adopted sustainable development goals and Agenda 2013 in 2015 that sowed the seeds for a number of global initiatives like this conference and the UN Ocean Conference to fight ocean change. Our diplomats and environmental experts were privileged to have been given the opportunity to lead the delibera deliberations at the 2015 UN SDG Summit on behalf of the Alliance of Small Island States. SDG was on top of the agenda as we represented 39 groups that belong to our island nations grouping. In the same year, as the chair of AOSIS, we continued to raise our voices in Paris for limiting the rise of global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The Paris Accord was a major breakthrough. 195 countries, including the largest emitters of greenhouse gas pollution, China, EU, 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 
US, India, and all of the other top 10 emitters pledged to pursue efforts to cut down the emission to maintain the agreed limit. Today, just three years after Paris, we should ask, are we, or rather are they, keeping their promises to cut emissions as agreed? I will let you ponder over that, but let me give you some facts. Each country determined what it would be willing to do under the Paris Agreement. So far, 185 countries have ratified or adopted the Paris Agreement, but by June this year, none of the 30, uh, top 30 emitters have actually made any efforts sufficient to hold the increase in global temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. To make things worse, the US withdrew from the deal less than a year after its ratification. According to IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2018 report, according to that report, we are still headed towards a 3 to 4 degrees world. That means our coral reefs will have died from bleaching 30 years from now. Ladies and gentlemen, although a small island developing state, the Maldives is also a large ocean state. Hence, in addition to our advocacy on climate and ocean change, the Maldives is committed to transform our country into a blue economy. The concept of blue economy refers to a sustainable development approach in which ocean resources are utilized for economic growth while preserving ocean and coastal ecosystem health. Our fishermen have been committed to sustainable methods of fishing, such as pole and line and long line, for as long as our forefathers discovered the presence of tuna in the deep seas. And this healthy fisheries of ours would continue to be the bloodline of our 21st century economy. The main threat to Maldives marine ecosystem, particularly our near shore systems, are overexploitation, habitat destruction, climate change, and pollution. Over harvesting of certain species such as sea cucumber and grouper are major threats to our rich biodiversity. Reef reclamation and coral mining for large scale resort development projects have become a major concern in recent years. The current government recognizes that all these threats arise out of dire economic necessity. Yet, rich uh, and unique marine biodiversity of the Maldives is a significant part of our tradition, livelihood, and is also the bedrock of our economy. Therefore, focus is given to protect the natural habitats of the marine life and to protect uh, formulate resource management plans for the protected areas so that the coastal communities may receive the socio-economic benefits of our ecosystem. Plans have been laid out to support local communities to build nurseries to foster green, green spaces and to invest in restoring our ecosystems such as the reefs and the mangroves. Expanding and developing the renewable energy sector is also a key priority in transitioning into a climate resilient and environmentally sustainable economy and focus is placed on removing barriers to investment, strengthening the institutional framework and promoting energy conservation and efficiency. In order to reduce marine pollution, waste management is geared towards reducing, reusing, recycling and repurposing. With the implementation of these policies, waste will become a valuable resource that will be managed at all levels. Indeed, a paradigm shift is necessary in how we deal with the oceans, and embracing the concept of a blue economy is a move in that direction. Ladies and gentlemen, our coastal shores are extremely susceptible to the dangers of climate and ocean change. Most of the islands in our archipelago are barely a meter and a half above the mean sea level, making the country vulnerable to sea swells and storm-generated waves, resulting in severe coastal erosion and flooding. For some, the Indian Ocean tsunami might have been a story of the past, but we continue to live with our minds haunted with the memory of that tragic day of December 2004, with every tidal wave that met our shores. And it reminds us of the imminent threat we ought to live with. Yes, the impact of climate change and, and ocean change may well be the greatest threat to mankind in the 21st century, but I am optimistic that man has the will and the acumen to combat it. For we have the courage to beat the odds to bring about lasting peace for the world. After the bloody wars of the early, early 20th century, we should have the audacity to live in peace with nature, the lands, the oceans in the 21st century and beyond. Thank you very much.